Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Vincent van Gogh, for over a year of his life, was restricted to living in a mental institution in the southern part of France. It's while he was there that he painted some of his greatest masterpieces, but he was trapped. He rarely could go outside. Oftentimes he'd paint something that he saw through the window, maybe flowers in a vase sitting on a table. On the rare occasion, he'd get to go outside to the courtyards under the supervision of an attendant. He was physically trapped. But he wasn't just physically trapped, he, he was also trapped by the, the, the musings of his mind. Depression, despair began to overtake him. His brother Theo wanted to encourage him, so he wrote him a letter while he was living in this mental institution. And in that letter he included an etching from a guy by the name of Rembrandt called The Raising of Lazarus. And this is going to come up on your screen, which I think is going to be right over here for you. And it's The Raising of Lazarus, and this was the etching that Van Gogh received from his brother, trying to just bring him a little bit of hope. And what we see here in this etching, it's very bright. Jesus comes with a sense of hope raising Lazarus from the dead who can't do anything, right? And Martha and Mary are there. But do you notice something about this etching here? Right? Notice nobody's looking to Jesus. In fact, Jesus comes bringing this sense of hope and resurrection, and everybody's looking kind of away from Jesus. You know, I think that's true for our life in this time of pandemic, but also this just time of life when oftentimes we go through despair and deep pain on the inside of our, our lives. Oftentimes we, we look for a source of hope, we look for a source of meaning, we look for a source of life. But so many times, as we do that, we're looking everywhere for that except to Jesus the only one who can actually bring that life to us. You know, many of us, as the Apostle Paul is talking about in our New Testament reading this morning, many of us look to the, to, to the law for a source of life. You might say, well, what's the law? That's kind of a church jargon term, but I think we all do it. We all want to look towards the things that we, we can do Right, to how we can kind of climb out of our pit of despair by, by living a certain way and, and doing certain things. We want to we look to ourselves and what we are doing rather than looking to Jesus. I know when I was a freshman in college, my father had passed away a couple months before. I was in deep de prayer and de despair and depression. You know, things weren't going very well for me, but I ended up going to this kind of small campus ministry, First Lutheran Church in Gainesville, Florida. And when I came, I was very kind of skirmish, skittish, didn't really want to get involved, wanted to stay sort of at an arm's length distance from everything. But there was people there. They befriended me. They showed me hospitality. They invited me to Bible study. They invited me over to their homes for barbecues before gator games and things like that. And I got to know a few of these people. But I didn't know how to act around them. You know, most of these people, that, these new friends of mine, they, you know, they knew the Bible, right? They could tell you Bible stories. They were like, well, you know, Paul and Romans says this, and Jesus says this, and Luke chapter 10, and all these different things, and I was kind of lost. Right? But I remember one of my new friends there, I think this was like my freshman year of college, first semester, freshman year. You know, he didn't have a car. I had a car. And he asked me, he said, hey, Mark, I need a ride to go somewhere. Can you come pick me up? I said, yeah, no problem. I was excited to have a new friend, excited to help out. So I drove to his dorm to pick him up. And I remember I parked outside of his dorm. I gave him a call. This was like before text messaging was a thing. Gave him a call and said, hey, I'm outside. He goes, I'll be down in a second. And I remember I was listening to the station I always listened to. It was the local alternative rock station. 
And I can remember listening to that kind of loud in my car, and I saw him walking down the sidewalk, and I was like, oh, no, you know what? I, I better change really fast. I hit seek, 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 find the Christian radio station, because I don't want this new Christian friend of mine to, to think that I'm, I'm like a heathen or something. Right? I, I want him to, to know that I, I'm just as much of a Christian as he is. But I want to do things. Right? I think we all do that. We all want to live by, by works of the law. And we find meaning in those. We want to be good people. We want to go serve people. And, and while serving people and loving people are good, and listening to Christian music is, of course, a wonderful thing to do. But if we're looking to those things and living a certain way to give us life, it doesn't work that way. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he writes to encourage them. They're experiencing persecution. They're experiencing oppression. And this is what he writes to encourage them to do. He writes to encourage them not to, to look to the law. He says in Romans chapter 7, verse 5, he says, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passion, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. If you're trying to live and trust in the works of the law, the, the things that you are able to do, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit, reminds us that those things actually lead to death, not to life. Right? If you say, do these things and, and then you'll live, do these things and then you'll, then you'll have life and hope, the Apostle Paul says, no. Doing these things and trusting in these things actually lead to death. You know, maybe if you're a Christian, you'd say, well, you know, didn't Jesus say something about that? Didn't Jesus himself say, do these and, and you will live? Well, yes, yes, he did. But you've got to get the context right. Right, as, as Jesus said, do these and, and then you will live, it's in the context of the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is found in Luke chapter 10. Right, this Pharisee, this teacher of the law, comes up to Jesus, kind of asking what he needs to do to have life, what he needs to do to be saved. And Jesus asks him a question. He says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Right? Do this and, and you will live. Right? And then the man asked another question. Right? And it says, desiring to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Desiring to say, hey, I've, I've loved my neighbor and I've done all these good things. I've followed the works of the law completely. He asked Jesus the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus, tell me I've loved my neighbor very well. And you know what Jesus says? He tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, which most likely you've heard, right? There's a, a, a man that's beat up on the side of the road, a bloody mess. And sure enough, this, this priest and somebody that knows the law kind of comes walking by and wants nothing to do with him, leaves him there to just die. But then a Samaritan comes up. And the thing to note is Samaritans, right? So, Samaritans, they, they were known as kind of dirty people. They were half-breeds, right? If you were one of God's Israelites, Hebrews, you didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans. But you know how the story goes. The Samaritan, right, right takes them, binds up his wounds, takes them to a place where he can recover and make sure he's taken care of. But who's the neighbor? or the one who showed mercy, that Samaritan. And this teacher of the law is there saying, okay, I, I, I'm not going to love a Samaritan, right? I, I, I can't do this. I can't do this and live. Right? Later on, right, another section of the Gospels, a rich ruler, a rich kind of Pharisee-type guy comes up to Jesus and says, you know, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? He says, well, you know, love God, love people. He says, you know, I've, I've done all these things, Jesus. And he's looking for Jesus to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But Jesus looks at this rich man and says, well, no, no, no. Sell all of your possessions and give them to the poor. 
the man leaves dejected because he had great wealth. And the disciples look to Jesus and they're kind of like, Jesus, what's going on? Who then can be saved? Who then can have this life if, they, if even this guy didn't, didn't make the cut? It must be impossible to have that life and that hope. And Jesus very famously answers here in Luke chapter 18. What is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Jesus does the impossible for you. Jesus is the one who comes to you and gives you that life. He gives you his life as he suffers and dies for you, not because you and I deserve it, but because he loves you that much. Jesus doesn't say, come on, dig yourself out of that pit, come meet me halfway. No, Jesus enters into your despair, he enters into your sin and your pain and he allows it to crush him and he dies. He's dead for three days, but his father raises him to life for you. That you might have that promise that Jesus has met you in those pits and Jesus will bring you to life. Of course, we can talk about everlasting life at the end of the world when he returns, but, but also life here and now where you are forgiven, where his spirit is being poured into you to make you new, to make you have that hope here and now, even in the middle of a pandemic, even in the middle of pain and despair. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 7. He's continuing, he's saying, you know, if you're trying to live by the works of the law, that's just going to bring about the fruit of death. But he continues, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Jesus has poured out his Spirit upon you. He's died and been raised for you and been raised up for you so that his Spirit might guide and direct you and, and lead you to the to, to fruits of righteousness, to fruits of the Spirit love, joy, peace, patience. He meets you in your, your despair and your pain and gives you that life. And here's the interesting thing. If you go back to Van Gogh as he was in that mental institution in the south of France, remember he received that letter from his brother Theo with, with, with an etching of this painting of Rembrandt, the, the raising of Lazarus, where Jesus was there in all of his glory, and everybody was looking everywhere but to Jesus. He received that, and we know that Van Gogh got it. Because after receiving that etching, one of the next paintings that Van Gogh painted was a very famous painting of his. You've probably seen it before. We'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. It's called The Raising of Lazarus. Right, you've probably seen that, but we know by looking at this that Van Gogh got Jesus and understood that Jesus was there and what he was doing. And you might kind of look at this and think, hold on a second. Right, Jesus isn't even in the painting, right? Isn't that just Martha and Mary kind of pulling the, the grave linen back and, and Lazarus is, is coming up uh, from death to life? Like, where's Jesus? He, he's not showing Jesus here. And that's right, Jesus isn't in the painting here. He's in Rembrandt's painting, but he's not in Van Gogh's painting. But I know that Van Gogh saw Jesus and the hope that Jesus brought and the life that Jesus brings. Because look here at Van Gogh's painting just a little bit more. Right? Look at Lazarus. Look at his face. Whose face is that? It's the face of Vincent Van Gogh. Van Gogh painted himself into the person that was the dead man that had no hope. The man with no hope that was being raised by Jesus himself. Right? Van Gogh didn't paint himself as Jesus coming to, to rescue himself. He didn't paint himself as Martha or Mary trying to, to get the preparations ready for Jesus to come. No, he painted himself as the dead man. 
The man with seemingly no hope, but the man who received the hope and the life of Jesus as Jesus was raised. That's the hope that you and I have as we live in God's greater story. Jesus has come to us in our despair, and he has raised us up to life. So live with that hope, knowing that Jesus has brought you into his life. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.